I decided to give the luxury car you bought to my parents, I said calmly. What are you talking about? Roger responded, his confusion evident. Mom and Dad are really happy with it, I continued. Wait a minute. Did you buy it with the intention of giving it to them? Yes, that's right. No matter what you say, it's already done. If you disobey me, I'll divorce you. Divorce? Who's saying that? I asked, feeling a surge of frustration. Fine. I'm happy to do it, I retorted. At that moment, something inside me broke. Roger's threat felt like the final straw. My name is Kathy, and I'm a 37-year-old office worker. I live with my husband, Roger, and our seven-year-old daughter, Sarah. Roger and I both work hard, so we manage well financially. Our daughter is growing up beautifully, and I'm content with my life. However, I do have complaints about Roger. Roger is the kind of person who puts his parents above everything else, including our family. While it's good that he cares about his parents, it often comes at the expense of our daughter and me. For instance, when I was in labor, I called Roger at work to let him know I was about to give birth and asked him to come to the hospital. His response was, I'm sorry, but my mom just burned her finger. I need to go to my parents' house. I couldn't believe that he was more concerned about his mother's minor burn than about my impending childbirth. My mother-in-law had only received a small burn from touching a pen that was on fire, and she had already cooled it down under running water. I was stunned that she had called Roger and even more so that Roger rushed to her side in such a panic. Roger is generally hardworking and kind, but his prioritization of his parents over our family deeply bothers me. Another incident occurred on Sarah's first birthday, which coincided with a trip Roger's parents had planned. They had asked Roger to drive them, and he chose to do that instead of celebrating our daughter's birthday with us. When he finally returned home, he stayed at a hotel with his parents because they could get an extra room. I couldn't believe he would prioritize a trip with his parents over our daughter's first birthday. This incident shook my trust in him. Despite these recurring issues, I couldn't easily bring myself to divorce him. I still loved Roger and didn't want to deprive our daughter of her father so readily. It wasn't that he didn't care about Sarah. He was not indifferent to her. I held on to the hope that he would eventually prioritize her. But as the years went by, he never celebrated her birthdays with us. She is now seven, and he still believes her birthdays should be a private affair between the two of us. I've tried to ensure she doesn't feel neglected. I once considered inviting my in-laws to celebrate our daughter's birthday with us, but they declined, saying it would be too much of a hassle to come over. It's true that it takes about two hours by car to get to our home from my in-law's place, but Roger frequently makes that drive without complaint. Their reluctance felt selfish to me, especially since they always seem to prioritize their own convenience. My mother-in-law's selfishness goes beyond just the inconvenience of travel. She openly expressed disappointment that our daughter wasn't a boy. I wanted you to have a boy, she said. Why did you disobey me? I was stunned by her words. I don't think it's possible to choose the sex of your child, nor do I believe it's crucial to have a boy. Roger's family isn't particularly prominent, it's just that my mother-in-law is old-fashioned and fixated on having a male hair. The real issue is Roger's constant need to please his mother, even at the expense of our family. This tendency is evident in how he neglects to celebrate our daughter's birthdays with us. Roger is more concerned with satisfying his parents' demands than with being present for his own family. When Roger took me to his family's New Year's gathering, my mother-in-law's behavior was even worse. She constantly belittled me, not just for not giving her a grandson, but for various other reasons as well. Kathy, why can't you do things faster? Look, there's someone with an empty cup. Why haven't you refilled it? She treated me like a servant, making derogatory comments about my job in front of the relatives. My son is wonderful, but his wife is a disaster. Her job is just data entry. I don't understand how she doesn't get tired of it. I've told her many times that my job involves more than just data entry, it's an engineering, but she dismisses my work as unimportant. It frustrates me that she also ignores our daughter, giving New Year's gifts to other relatives' children but not to ours. I'm also upset with Roger for not standing up to her. It's disheartening to see our daughter mistreated and to be ridiculed by his mother while Roger seems to laugh off the insults. He even adds to the humiliation by claiming I'm not good enough, all in front of his relatives. I didn't want to deprive our daughter of her father, so I tried to be patient. However, my feelings for Roger gradually faded. Then one day, Roger asked me for a favor. Actually, there's something I want to buy, he said. What is it? I asked. 
a car, he replied. I was taken aback. Roger had never shown any interest in cars or anything like that. Why all of a sudden? I just thought it might be nice to get a new one. I drive to my parents' house all the time, and I thought it might be refreshing to have a change, he explained. We live near a supermarket, and I don't drive much. Cars have never been my interest, so I figured I'd leave the decision up to Roger since he would be the main user. Well, it's up to you. You use the car more than I do, I said. Roger looked pleased but then added with a slightly apologetic tone, Oh, and here's the thing. I'll pick out the car, but I'd like you to cover the cost. I was stunned. Roger wanted a new car but couldn't afford it himself. He was asking me to pay for it. My salary supports our family's finances, and I didn't expect Roger's salary to contribute significantly. During my maternity leave, Roger hadn't contributed his salary to our household expenses, so I had to return to work right after giving birth. As an engineer, I managed to negotiate remote work arrangements with my company, which allowed me to balance work and family responsibilities from home. While raising our daughter when she was little, I worked hard and found it selfish of Roger to use his salary for himself while expecting me to cover the costs of a new car. However, when he was in a good mood he would often help care for our daughter, so I decided to go along with his request. Okay, are you sure? Thank you, he said, visibly thrilled. Roger was so excited that he immediately started browsing catalogs and researching online. Since I was the one paying for it, I made a suggestion. Since it's just the three of us, it doesn't need to be a big car. Yeah, I know, he responded vaguely. Roger seemed to just nod along without really taking my input to heart. He frequently visited the car dealership over the next couple of weeks, talking with the dealer. Then, one day, he told me he was ready to buy the car and took me to the dealership. I sat down to wait while he made the final arrangements. When he came over, he handed me the contract and showed me the car, a large luxury minivan. Oh my god, I exclaimed, are we really buying this? Yeah, it's nice, I'm really excited, Roger said. Wait a minute, I protested, I don't think we need a vehicle this big. I mean, it's a lot of car for just the four of us. Even if we have another baby, this seems excessive. Roger insisted it was a good choice, but I was taken aback by the discrepancy between what I had envisioned and what was presented. Are we really going to buy this car? I asked repeatedly, feeling frustrated. Why do you keep saying the same thing? Roger snapped. You're making the dealer uncomfortable. You're the one who said to leave it to you, I replied, exasperated. I did agree, but that turned out to be the problem. Roger signed the contract, and then the dealer explained the cost. I was shocked by the price. I can't pay this all at once, I said. We'll need to get a loan or something. Fine, I guess I don't have a choice, I replied, feeling frustrated. Roger insisted on having the car registered in his name, so we took out a loan. From now on, I would deposit money into Roger's account to cover the car payments. The car was finally delivered to our house. When Roger saw the car, he was ecstatic. Whoa, it's so cool, he exclaimed. I thought, if he's happy with it, why not? But then something unexpected happened. On the weekend, Roger grabbed the car keys, and I asked him where he was going. Oh, we're heading to my parents' place, he said. I was surprised. He was leaving her daughter behind to visit his parents again. You're taking the new car, aren't you? I asked. Yes, that's right, Roger replied with a grin. I have decided to give the luxury car you bought as a present to my parents. What are you talking about? I was stunned. You said you wanted the car, so I agreed to buy it. Now you're giving it away. Mom and dad are thrilled with it, Roger said nonchalantly. Of course, I'll drive you around whenever we go out. So, you bought it as a gift for your parents from the start? I asked, incredulous. Yes, I did, Roger admitted. You've got to be kidding me, I said, exasperated. You said you wanted it, so I agreed. If I had known you were planning to give it to your parents, I never would have agreed. Well, it's already bought and in my name, Roger said coldly. I can do what I want with it. If you disobey me, I'll divorce you. The threat of divorce was the final blow. At that moment, something inside me, which had been holding me back, finally collapsed. I had been trying to comply with Roger, but my rational mind kept telling me that I shouldn't get a divorce just because of our daughter. Despite Roger's clear preference for his parents over us, I believed he still cared about our family, me, and our daughter. But the way he could so easily put us aside for his parents was shocking. How could he think that threatening divorce was acceptable? Who does he think he is? 
determined to show him that he's the one in trouble, I resolved, fine, let's get a divorce. What? Roger asked, taken aback. I don't want you around anymore. Go back to your mother and father, mama's boy. I tried to provoke him, and as planned, Roger's face turned red with anger. Are you making fun of me? He snapped. Fine, let's get a divorce right now. Roger stormed off to get the divorce papers. While he was at the city office, I began packing my things. I called my parents, explained the situation, and asked them to pick me up. I also told my daughter to pack her belongings. When Roger returned, he had the papers in hand, filled out in a dark, angry scrawl. Without hesitation, I signed my portion. Well, I'll file these, I said, so you can just go. I'm going, even if you don't tell me to, Roger replied with disdain. You're really such a terrible wife, you know. Roger stomped out, his footsteps echoing loudly. I wondered why I had stayed married to someone like him for so long. If I had to go through this, I should have left him sooner. But it was too late for regrets now. I felt a deep sense of relief as I moved on from Roger. From now on, I would focus on doing my best as a single mother. Just minutes after Roger left, my parents arrived to help. Together, we finished packing up our belongings, loaded them into my parents' car, and headed to our new home. In the meantime, I had filed the divorce papers, and our divorce was finalized. It was just a piece of paper, but as I submitted it and realized we were no longer officially married, I felt an unexpected weight lift from my shoulders. Next, I began searching for a new place for my daughter and me. About a week after the divorce, while visiting my parents' house, I saw the luxury car Roger had purchased. Walking in with my daughter, I was surprised to find Roger and my ex-in-laws in the living room. When my mother saw us, she took my daughter to another room. I approached the living room where Roger, clearly flustered, began speaking urgently. Oh, Kathy, what's the insurance on that car? Roger asked, his tongue frantic. Why are you here, barging into our house like this? I responded coldly. My ex-in-laws raised their voices in response. We don't want to be here either. We came because we had no other choice. I was taken aback by their anger. My father, clearly annoyed, quietly expressed his frustration. If that's the case, you should leave. If you don't, we can call the police to remove you. Horrified, my ex-in-laws fell silent. Roger turned back to me, still agitated. Kathy, what's going on with the insurance payments? I sighed, trying to stay calm. Did you forget what you said when you signed the contract? You insisted the car be registered in your name. So you bought the car and took out the loan in your name, which means the insurance is also your responsibility. Roger's face fell as he realized his mistake. He had chosen to prioritize his pride over practical considerations, and now he was stuck with the financial burden. It turned out that Roger and his parents, eager to show off their new luxury car, had driven it recklessly and ended up crashing it. The front of the car was badly damaged. Reflecting on the situation, I felt a sense of vindication. The car was parked in a way that I couldn't see the damage directly. I hadn't inspected it properly before, so now Roger and his parents came to me, asking about the insurance. Since the car was financed by a loan, it was technically owned by the loan company, and any repairs needed would fall on them. Without insurance, they were responsible for the entire cost of the repairs, including fixing the guardrail they hit. I dreaded to think of how expensive it would be to repair a luxury car. Roger and his parents eventually returned the car, and they faced a hefty bill for the repairs. Afterward, I started receiving numerous emails from Roger, begging me to reconcile. One message detailed how he couldn't afford to pay rent or utilities and had moved back in with his parents. It seemed that Roger's parents were treating him harshly because of the car accident. Now, he was unwilling to stay at home due to their attitude, but couldn't manage on his own because of his debt. Despite his pleas, Roger's insistence on seeing our daughter seemed incredibly selfish given everything that had happened. I ignored his emails and didn't reveal our new address to him. My only concern was whether our daughter missed him, but surprisingly she seemed perfectly content and was enjoying her life. I remained focused on providing the best life I could for her. I believe that putting your own parents before your child, while making your spouse pay for luxuries meant for them, is unacceptable. Roger's choices led to his downfall, and he truly brought this on himself. I hope that Kathy and her daughter continue to find happiness together. Thank you for watching until the end. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to our channel. See you in the next video.